Welcome to section searching and reporting. In this section, we will talk about SPL, how to deal with time, how to perform a Splunk search, and other important topics related to searching with Splunk. Welcome to this segment and this section. In this short video, I want to explore the Splunk search and reporting app. This app comes pre-installed with Splunk Enterprise and you can access it very easily from the Splunk homepage by cl simply clicking on search and reporting. Now recall that apps that have GUIs, graphical user interfaces, will appear on our app browser on the sidebar here. So search and reporting does have a graphical user interface. And the first thing I want to do is explore the landing page of the search app. We have the search bar where we type in our SPL, Splunk Processing Language. We have our Time Picker. We have our Search Mode Picker. We have Smart Mode, Fast Mode, and Verbose Mode. And we'll talk more about that in a later lecture. We have our Data Summary. And we've seen this a few times already before. This shows us all of the data that is coming into our Splunk instance and the metadata for it. So here's the host metadata, the sources metadata, and the source types metadata. We also have quick links to the Splunk documentation and a Splunk tutorial. And one of the great features of Splunk is you can click here on expand your search history and you can see every search you've ever done. Here I have more than nine pages of searches. So if you put together a really complex, really powerful search and you accidentally lose it, it will be stored here as long as you've actually used it as a search. Up at the top in the green bar, we have quick links to data sets, reports that we've created, alerts that we've created, and dashboards that we've created. And that is really all there is to the Splunk search app. And I thank you for joining me in this segment. I look forward to seeing you in the next segment. Welcome to this segment on the Splunk search pipeline. It's important to understand how Splunk deals with your search string that you put in. And this has implications as to the performance of Splunk as well. So let's get the basics down. And Splunk relies heavily on that Unix pipe operator. It's the key right above your enter key on most US keyboards. This is a funny bumper sticker that Splunk sells on their website. It says, Splunk, put that in your pipe and Splunk it. Here's how the search pipeline looks at a very high level. We have a lot of data over on the left side, and then just the data we want in the format we want over on the right side. A Splunk SPL search string is really a process of whittling down the data until you get exactly what you want and in the format that you want it. Let's take a look at a mock search. The big part of the data there on the left side might just be a broad metadata search. Host equals my host, source type equals CSV. And then we might include some keywords to sort of narrow it down. Maybe we're only looking for fails or failures or locked, or if we have specific fields we're looking for, like user equals some username, we can narrow it down even further. Then we're doing a pipe, and a pipe really means take all of the data before it on the left side and then do something with it. And this is where we uh, input our command, common commands, count, sum, eval, etc. And then we're doing another pipe, and this is where we make our visualization or our statistical table that shows the data we want in the format we want it. Looking at a real search, and don't worry too much about the mechanics of the search as we will go over SPL in more depth in another lecture, but let's break this down. We have, first of all, source type equals win event log security, event code equals 4625, and user equals star. That's all before the first pipe. We're searching for a specific source type, win event log colon security. That is the security portion of the Windows event logs. Event code 4625, if you Google that, you will see that it is, it is a failed login attempt that Windows registers. And then user equals star. That really means that 
We want Splunk to pull in all of the users. We don't have a specific user in mind that we're searching for. And then we're finally building either a table or a visualization. In this case, we're doing time chart. So we're building a line chart that spans, or in other words, it takes a sample of the data every hour. And we're counting by event code by user. So that means that we want the time chart to display time on the x-axis. And we want to know the users that are most in violation of generating that event code. In other words, we want to know the users that have the most failed login attempts. In other words, we're piping the previous data into that time chart command. And we're using the span one hour statement, which means I'm forcing the chart to have one hour increments. And that event code, I specifically searched for event code 4625. So it's only going to bring in that event code. If I did event code equals star wildcard, then it would bring in all event codes. And here's what that time chart looks like, where we have the count of failed logins by user. And Splunk builds us a nice line chart and it color codes all the users. And we can do other things to it too. We can say like we only want to know the top 10 or the rarest 10, the users with the least amount of failed login attempts. We can also just build a statistical table using the stats command instead of the time chart command. And it would look something like this where users on the left side and then count is on the right side. And of course we could sort as well by count. Including the default field of underscore time will then allow us to make more sense of this data by putting a timestamp on each of the events. So here we're saying we want a statistical table and we want the users listed and the number of failed logins. And we want our table with that, with that table command, we're saying we want our table to show the first field will be time, the second field will be user, and the third field will be count of that event code. And then we're going to sort by time. So this is a use case in which we would want to know the most recent time a user failed to log on and how many logon attempts that user had. So putting that exact search back into our search pipeline, we can see that we're getting a lot of data up front, win event log security, event code 4625, and every single user. If this is a large organization, then there might be a lot of users. Then we're doing a pipe, stats count event code by user, and then time. And finally, we are visualizing it with a table that has the timestamp, the user, and the count of event code. And then we're sorting by time because we want to know the newest, most recent violation and how many violations there were. So that's just an example of the Splunk search pipeline. And I hope you're really pumped for learning a little bit about SPL. We'll dive into basic SPL. We'll look at time. We'll look at time chart. We'll do some intermediate SPL as well. So please stay with me. I'm really excited about this. Welcome to the segment on basic searching. I have a feeling that this is what you've been waiting for. In this segment, we're going to talk about how to start creating your very first basic Splunk SPL search string. And we'll start by learning what the basic search terms, or as I like to call them, building blocks, are. And they are built on keywords, phrases, fields, wildcards, and booleans. Keywords are just what you would expect, failed, error. Phrases are multiple keywords, and we put phrases in quotes because they have a space, in the middle. Fields are key value pairs, so something equals something else. An example of a field would be user equals and then the username. We'll talk about fields in more depth later on in the course. Wildcards are important to understand as well. Using the asterisk, what we are telling Splunk is we don't care what takes the place of that asterisk. So if we use the first wildcard there, asterisk A-I-L-E-D, Splunk will find failed, or perhaps mailed, or anything else that ends in A-I-L-E-D. If we use fail asterisk, then Splunk could return fail, failure, failures, and the same with user. If we use user equals asterisk, 
that's telling Splunk that we want to pull in every single user. Boolean operators in Splunk are and, or, and not, and they are case sensitive. An example of a Boolean operator in a search string might be if we wanted to find data about two specific users. We might say user equals user1, capital and, user equals user2. Then Splunk would only bring us the events that have both of those users in them. Next we have commands. And commands do stuff with the data. Our keywords and fields bring in the data, and then commands do stuff with it. Commands come after a pipe, as we'll see in just a second here. But some of the basic and well-used commands are chart and time chart. This returns results in tabular output for charting. And time chart specifically forces the x-axis of the chart to be time, whereas in chart you define what the x-axis should be. Rename is self-explanatory. Sort is self-explanatory. Stats provides statistics, and often you would use stats to build a statistical tabular table. We can use eval to calculate an expression, dedupe to remove duplicates, and the ever popular table command builds a table with the specified fields that you specify. So if you do table, space, field one, space, field two, space, field n, for example. Here is how we construct a basic search. The first thing we do is put in our search terms. These could be metadata, like host, source, or source type, if we know what that is. Or we could use a wildcard, of course. And keywords and booleans, and anything in, back in the basic search terms slide. Then we use that pipe operator, and that is the key right above your enter key on most US keyboards. And then we can start typing commands. This is how we massage the data. Don't be put off by that pipe operator. All that means to Splunk is take whatever comes before it and then do something with it. So here's a mock search. If we have search terms, host equals myhost.local. And as we know, host is a metadata keyword that's automatically assigned in Splunk unless we specify otherwise. And same with source. And then we have user equals asterisk, which means we want to know information about all the users. And we have message equals fail asterisk, which means we are not sure if the message is fail, failure, failed, fail yours, or something like that. So we're just bringing everything that starts with F-A-I-L. And we're using a Boolean operator there, or, and lock asterisk. So that could be lock, locked, locks, I guess. So we're telling Splunk that we want to know every user, and we want the message to equal something that starts with fail or something that starts with lock. And that's different than and. If we did and, then the message would have to contain both fail and lock. But since we're doing or, the message can contain fail or lock. Next we're doing some commands. And right at the start there we can see the popular table command. And then we simply list the fields that we want the table to have, the columns. So we have underscore time, which is Splunk's default time field, and we'll talk more about time later. We have user, which we've pulled in with that user equals asterisk, so we have pulled in the user field, so we, it will display something there. And then message, and message will either contain, fail, or lock. And after the next pipe, we are renaming those fields, because let's say that underscore time, lowercase user, and lowercase message is not what we want to see. So we're saying rename underscore time as time with capital T, user as user with a capital U, message as message with a capital M. And then we do another pipe, and we sort by the time field. So pause the video right now, and see if you can come up with what the output of this search string is going to look like. Here is what it will look like. We have three fields, three columns, time, user, and message. We have a timestamp, we have usernames, and we have the message that either contains fail or lock. Let's take a look at 
basic searching in our demo. And we've logged into our Splunk search head. And what I want to do right now is add some new data. I want to add the homework data set CSV file. So I'm going to go, going to, go to settings, add data, upload, select file, and there it is, homework data set dot CSV. It'll upload it. We click next and we check everything out on the source type. It is a CSV. It's pretty self-explanatory for Splunk, so we're good with that. On input settings, I want to name the host field value homework and the index can stay at default. Review and submit and let's go back home and to the search app and since we specified that the host field value is homework we can bring up this entire set of data just by using that metadata field and there it is 2000 rows 2000 events and this is bringing in everything now because we are in smart mode and we'll talk about modes in a different lecture but because we are in smart mode Splunk attempts to detect fields for us based on key value pairs. Remember, key value pairs is just like this host equals homework. That's a key value pair. Source equals homework data.csv. That's also a key value pair. So Splunk attempts to determine what fields are out there in the data automatically, which is great. And we can get a snapshot and take a quick look at these fields. For, so, for example, domain has five different values or five factors and there they are so in our mock search let's say that we want to bring in the domain data and let's say that we don't care which domain data it is because we just want to know the name of the domain because we want to use it later so we'll simply do domain equals asterisk and let's run that search and again 2000 events because every single event has that field in it Let's see what other fields might be interesting to us. We have a type field that has five different factors or five different values. Retry, success, lock and fail, and NA. So let's imagine that we want to know about fail and lock just like in the slide. So let's do a Boolean. And that field was called type. So we'll say type equals fail asterisk or lock asterisk. Now this should narrow our total events down quite a bit. It cut our number of events more than in half. So we only have 949 now because we're only looking for events that have this word or this word in them. So what can we do with this data right now? Well, we could create a table that shows the domain and the type. And that would be pretty simple and pretty easy to do. So let's do that with a table command. And remember for commands, we first do this pipe and then the command. And then the fields we want, the table command Syntax is table space field one space field two space field n, right? So we want table, domain, and type. Let's see what that gives us. This gives us a nice list of each domain and either fail or lock. But it still doesn't tell us a very good story because we need a timestamp. So recall that the default timestamp field in Splunk is underscore time. And we can simply add that to our table. So now we have a timestamp, a domain, and a type that's either fail or lock. That still doesn't really tell us everything we need to know. I think we would need to know what user account has failed or is locked. So let's go back to our raw events and because we've already put a command in here we actually need to change this to verbose mode. 
and go back to our raw events and let's see if there's a user field there is a user field it looks like it's USR and those do look like usernames so let's bring that in with a wildcard and then we'll also add it to our table and it doesn't really matter where you put this so bringing in all user values and let's put the user field right before domain and let's see what that gives us in a table okay this is a much better picture we have a timestamp a username a domain and whether the account is locked or has failed in this section we talked about basic search structure and put together a very basic search in Splunk and I thank you for joining me and I look forward to doing some more searching with you in the upcoming sections.